Howdy dudes, it's Megan and I'm finally uploading something that isn't an update for the Kindle experiment. I know, sad times. No more half-hearted reading vlogs. Actually, I'm hard-pressed to call the videos I've been doing for the past month vlogs because they don't really match the picture in my head of what a vlog should be. Video Diary is definitely a more accurate description of those videos. The updates I gave you guys were at random intervals and all just me rambling incoherently while sitting in front of my computer. All I did was move the camera to different angles to change the backdrop up a little. It wasn't an effort to make people think I was in a different room, it was really just wherever was easiest to set up my tripod at the time. And yes, I'm back to doing voiceovers for this video. I'll probably be doing that for the next couple of videos because... To be honest, I look like shit right now, and I just don't have the mental energy left to drum up the amount of confidence or apathy it's going to take to film my videos the other way. I spent three hours over the last two nights filming the first two minutes of this video over and over again. I absolutely hated every single take, and it was getting to the point where I was starting to get mad at myself over it. Thus, I decided to take the easier route. Well... Easier for my mental health, not so much easier in terms of producing the final video. Way more moving parts whenever I do it this way. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this voiceover while I crochet an ugly blanket for my brother or fail to build bridges. I'm not really sure what's going to be in the background of this video yet, but hey, towards the end of the video, I'm going to get really salty about a particular book I read last month, so... Maybe that will make up for you guys not getting to see my lovely face. I've decided to roll my Kindle experiment postmortem and my May wrap up into one video because they are basically the same thing. Everything I read in May, I read for the Kindle experiment. Why give myself twice the work? This way I get one longer video instead of two smaller videos and a smaller headache while I'm editing. In theory. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, I'll put up a card somewhere on the screen to the original video where I explain what I was doing. The short version, though, is that I had the brilliant idea to only read books advertised on the front screen of my Kindle Paperwhite for the month of May. This was actually not as bad as I thought it would be. Not all of the books I read were terrible. In fact, most of them were really just middling, to be honest. The point of this exercise was to learn if anything influenced the ads for the Kindle devices aside from, I guess whoever is paying to put them on the front screen. Well, that really does seem to be the only thing that influences the advertisements. What I had read previously did not seem to affect what ads I got. I say this because I read primarily science fiction and fantasy. Actually, that's pretty much all I've read in the last several years. But the advertisements I got were from a variety of different genres. There was romance, mystery, science fiction, fantasy. There was even a nonfiction in there at some point. Oddly enough, what I was currently reading at the time also didn't seem to stop some ads because I got ads for Dark Light, On the Edge, and Temptation as I was reading those books. It was almost as if Kindle were trying to remind me that I had them checked out. Most of the books, probably 99% of them, were Kindle Unlimited books. There were maybe two ads for books outside of that program. Most of these books were self-published or published through one of Amazon's imprints. Again, maybe one or two of them were traditionally published. So on the ad side of things, what you see advertised on the front screen of your Kindle e-reader device is probably not tailored at all towards your reading taste. Those ads are probably just there because someone is paying for them to be there. Now, obvious disclaimer, this was not some professional scientific study. These are really just assumptions based off observations and random information collected in a spreadsheet. I also learned some non-data related things. I am too asexual for romance novels. There is so much sex in them and it makes me uncomfortable. I'm not a prude, I just don't understand it. I don't get the appeal. There's also a spectrum of romance books from classy smut to I can't believe this isn't classified as erotica. Speaking of classy smut, some of these books were written better than I expected. That's a weird segue. <laughs> I expected Dark Light to be terrible because it seemed a situation of quantity over quality, but that book wasn't actually that bad. And I'll, I'll get into that in a few minutes. In the end, I really can't decide if this experiment was a failure or a success. I think, considering all that's happening, I lacked the motivation or time management skills to do this experiment any justice. I mean, I only ended up reading four books. It took me two weeks each to read both Dark Light and The Atlantis Gene, and not because they were terrible books, but because I was either not motivated to read, or I got so hyper-focused on something else that time just got away from me. I do want to give this challenge of sorts another shot later in the year. Hopefully the Pandemic 2.0 experts are promising won't lock me in my house again for nearly three months. I think when things are back to normal-ish, or as close to normal as they're going to get, this might be easier for me, but we'll have to see what the rest of the year brings. Bonus points, I definitely got my money's worth out of my Kindle Unlimited subscription this month. I got $16 worth of ebooks out of my $10 subscription, so not bad. I usually only break even. All right, all that out of the way, let's talk about the books that I read this month as a result of the Kindle experiment. First up at bat is Dark Light by Bella Forrest. In all honesty, I didn't have high hopes going into this book. This author has released about 20 books a year since 2012. This particular series debuted in September of 2019, and the seventh installment came out just last month. That's a lot of books, guys. 
It's marketed as a vampire novel for grown-up Twilight fans. The only real similarity between this book and Twilight, though, is that the vampires weren't the same as traditional lore. They weren't burned by sunlight, but they didn't sparkle either. To be honest, it just seemed like the vampires in this novel were supernaturally powerful humans. Just stronger, faster, tougher. Isn't that a Daft Punk song or a Kanye song? I don't actually know anymore. In the end, I gave this book three stars. It wasn't bad, it was just boring. This book suffered, at least for me, from the fact that it was the start of a series. So it was a very slow burn. In this book, vampires disappeared some years ago. I forget how many, but you find out what happened fairly early on in the book. Our main character, Lyra, is kidnapped by one of them, and his name is Dorian, which is a very vampire name. And he explains everything that's happened to them so he can get her help in appealing to the humans for asylum. Coincidentally, literally coincidentally, she happens to be the niece of the guy who runs the Occult Bureau, or whatever it's called. Think the FBI crossed with the Marines and specifically designed to deal with supernatural stuff. This agency agrees to a trial period where they have the soldiers and the vampires work together under strict observation for several weeks to gauge the vampire's honesty and skills. This is what we spent a majority of the book on. A good chunk of this book is watching the vampires and the humans working together on various tasks and deployments. We see their relationships grow, and they even become friends with each other. Being that this was the first in a series, and I think I might have mentioned this in one of my vlog things, it really needed to tread a fine line between setting up the rest of the series, but giving me a satisfying enough ending that I didn't feel like I had wasted my time for a lot of the book. Again, this is all just my opinion, and in that opinion, it failed to do this. The way the plot progressed, it appeared that everything that had happened up to a point in the book was undone by one particular moment. Then, after that, our main character Lyra only saves the day because she accidentally stumbles onto the nefarious plan of the bad guys. Seriously, if she had been anyone else in this book, everybody would be dead. And I feel like, in the context of the whole series, the turning point of the novel might make more sense or have more impact. I'm just not curious enough to read the rest of it. I do have to give this author credit, though. The last several pages of this book were very well done. There were some interactions between some characters in those last few pages that were excellent. Heartbreaking, but excellent. And this isn't necessarily a mark against the book itself, but once again, in my suspiciousness, I predicted who the bad guy was the first time they showed up on the page. One of these days, I'll learn how to let go of that, because it really is starting to spoil the shock of some of these books. So yeah, again, I gave it three stars. In the end, it was a slow crawl of a book with an unsatisfying ending for someone who isn't looking to read the whole series. It was surprisingly well written for an author who cranks out so many books, so if you like unconventional vampires, ladies who can kick some ass if necessary, you're looking for a long series, I would recommend picking it up. Next up is On the Edge by Bernie Sahin. I'm going to try to talk about this book without sounding like an asshole because it wasn't a terrible book. It was the first romance novel I've ever read. Now, probably 80% of the books I read have a romance subplot in them somewhere. But for this one, the focus of the book was clearly the relationship between the two POV characters, and the plot was just a vessel for that relationship's growth. I actually read this book in about three to four hours. If you've watched all of my vlogs for May, you might have seen the sleep-deprived Megan rambling about this book in some few futile attempt to understand it. In On the Edge, we have two point of view characters. One of them is Anna. She's a girl from Kentucky who accepts an offer to be an intern for some big company in Dublin, Ireland. It's a short-term thing with more permanent opportunity at the end of it after some kind of presentation or competition I don't quite remember. Our other character is Adam. He's a member of a big Irish family that happens to own the company that Anna is working for. He even works there himself. His big secret is that he used to be an underground fighter, like MMA but less rules and definitely not legal. One of his friends gets himself into trouble and Adam finds himself pulled back into that world. The biggest thing I noticed about this book versus what I typically read is that the plot was a lot weaker. Adam swore he would never fight again because he almost killed a dude once. His parents spent a lot of money keeping him out of trouble and he promised for their sake to leave that life behind. But his friend Leslie gets himself into a lot of debt fighting for the same shady dude that used to sort of manage Adam. And instead of shady dude letting Adam pay him off, he wants Adam to fight the undefeated champion of the illegal fighting ring. I don't remember the shady dude's name, but it was very Irish. You might be asking yourself, where does Anna come into this? Well, she's renting the extra bedroom in Leslie's apartment for several weeks while she's at this internship. Except Les is in the hospital, so he has Adam greet her the night she comes into town. The only reason she's connected to this plot outside of her future relationship with Adam is that shady dude who runs the fight ring tells Adam he's gonna send some of his goons to rough her up if he doesn't fight. Well, they promise to do more than that, but still, it's just another thing he holds over Adam's head. This all happens in less than a 48-hour period, by the way. And that's it. That is the only reason Anna is tied up in this at all, because she just happened to be staying with the dude who nearly got his head knocked off, and Adam's alpha male gotta protect small woman instincts kicked in when she got threatened. 
Hence why I say this had a weaker plot, in the context of the genre and usual audience expectations for this sort of novel, that doesn't seem to be a bad thing, it was just a bit of a turnoff for me. Pun not intended. This book taught me that I may be too asexual for this genre. Within the first 20 pages, Adam and Anna are already hot for each other, instantly fantasizing about things. And once they get together and start doing it, they're doing it all of the time. So many pages after that is devoted to either them having sex, them talking about having sex, or them thinking about the times they had sex we didn't necessarily see. Also, the number of times I had to read about erect nipples was more than enough for one lifetime. Aside from the amount of sexy times in this book, I would think my only major complaint with it is that it felt imbalanced between the characters. It seemed we focused a lot more and learned more about Adam than we did Anna. By the time we learned of Anna's abusive ex-boyfriend, we'd already gotten to see 90% of Adam's dirty laundry. And there were just more interactions between Adam and other people in this book than Anna got. So much of her screen time, so to speak, was with Adam. There were some wasted opportunities. For example, Anna goes home for a family emergency and in the aftermath decides to finally tell her parents about her ex-boyfriend being an abusive asshole. But we don't see that scene. We just know that she did it because the next time she sees Adam, she tells him. This just seems like a really pivotal moment for the character that should have been seen on the page. I will give this author credit though, the portrayal of the effects an abusive relationship can have on a person in their future relationship seemed pretty accurate. Of course, I don't know this from personal experience, just from research on the topic, so I could be wrong there. Also, Anna had a lot more agency in terms of advancement in their relationship than I was expecting. For example, she's the one who makes it clear that she wants to take the next step in their physical relationship. You know, Adam's pulling the bad boy, I'm too dangerous for you shit, and she rightfully tells him that's her decision to make. I appreciated that. And clear lines of consent. That's also a plus, especially in a book that has so much sex in it. Overall, I gave On the Edge three stars as well. While I enjoyed it, I am definitely not the audience for this book. So, after reading the last book I'm going to talk about today, I was tempted to bump it up to four stars, because in comparison to that novel, this was so much better. We swing back into familiar territory with our next book, which is The Atlantis Gene by A.G. Riddle. This book was a meaty one compared to everything else that I read. It had 633 pages, whereas everything else I read this month was less than or right around 400 pages. Amazon lists this book as the Atlantis Gina thriller, but it definitely leans very heavily into science fiction. Oddly enough, it's actually a pandemic novel, appropriate for the times that we're living in. In this book, we follow three characters mainly. There are a handful more mentioned, but we focus mostly on these three characters. That is David Vale, who works for a sort of international clandestine intelligence agency called Clock Tower. We have Dr. Kate Warner, who is a scientist studying different ways to treat autism. And then we have Dorian, I can't remember his last name, who is on the council of something called the Imari Group or Corporation or something. Think the Illuminati, but less connected to the Masons, much older, and way better technology. It's hard to summarize the plot of this novel because it's complicated. To sum it up, David and Kate discover that Dorian and the Amari are trying to unleash something on the world that will kill most people living on it. It's their goal to force another great evolution onto mankind. Obviously from the title, The Lost City of Atlantis plays very heavily into this book, but I don't want to get too into it to avoid major spoilers. Kate and David are pretty much the only people who can stop the Amari after they put all the pieces together. Let's start with what I liked about this book. I have to give this author a huge round of applause because the imagination that went into this book is spectacular. He's taken both popular and obscure science and woven it into the story to create a believable explanation for many events in history. As an example, the origin of the Spanish flu pandemic is explained by the plot in a really creative way. In the universe of this book, quite a bit of the scenarios presented are very believable. And it presents a lot of this information so that even if you're stupid as hell, you can still grasp the various concepts in this book. This sort of leads me to a complaint directly related to the way some information is presented in this book. There will be moments in the book where character A or whoever will be explaining something to another character and it's this massive dialogue information dump. It'll be paragraphs and pages of characters explaining a concept or a plan or working through something. I thought it was something that would be focused towards the beginning of the book because it helps one character catch up another character to whatever is happening and also, by proxy, do the same for the reader. But there were several moments later in the book where this was still happening. It was difficult to keep my mind from wandering in these places, which is where listening to the audiobook and putting my phone out of reach really came in handy. Again, this book was very clever, both in the ways it immersed the relevant history into the plot and in the way some characters acted. Some of the stuff they did was just inventive. For example, at some point, Kate and David have to escape a monastery where they've been hiding as David is healing from gunshot wounds. 
spoiler alert, he spends most of the novel healing from gunshot wounds. They escape in a hot air balloon, and the monks in the monastery release like a bajillion more hot air balloons, all of different colors and designs, to cover their escape. That was just a good scene. This book is very much the opposite in some ways of so many books I've read this year. Shadow Magic and Darklight come to mind specifically. Instead of being a book where the first 60 to 70 percent is this slow crawl through the plot, and the last 40 to 30 percent is go go go, and the book ends suddenly, this was the very opposite. Within the first 30 pages, someone has discovered an old Nazi sub in Antarctica. There's a terrorist bombing and a special ops team kidnaps two children from an autism research facility. So it had a really powerful start, and for a good portion of the book, it is go, go, go. Either there's running and gunning, or there's at least something happening that's significantly moving the plot forward. And then it just stops. While David and Kate are hiding in the monastery, Kate is reading a journal to him that was given to her by some ancient monk hiding in the basement. There's a plot explanation for that. I don't know how many pages it took up, but it was a two to three hour chunk of the audiobook. We read this journal, which was some guy's first hand account of everything that led up to a certain event in the book. It's this huge slowdown in the progression of the plot, a very drastic change of pace. Because we spend most of our time reading about this World War I soldier as he recovers from nearly dying in a collapsed mine and everything he did as he was recovering and after he was recovering. Every now and again, we cut back to Kate and David just so you remember that they're there. And we also get some scenes of Dorian and everything that he's done. Again, almost as a reminder that you aren't suddenly reading a different book. Don't get me wrong, a lot of the information in this journal turned out to be relevant towards the end of the book. In my opinion, though, I don't think we needed to read all of it. No wonder this book was so meaty. You read half a dude's life story in it. I was trusting the author to use this information later, but it didn't make it any easier to read through. And there's some smaller problems I had with the book. Death felt like it had no meaning. There came a point where so many people were alive that were supposed to be dead that I stopped being surprised. The only people who stayed dead in this damn book were the guy at the beginning and this chick that Dorian sleeps with partway through the novel. Also, the author made some odd style choices. Towards the end of the book, there are so many random chapter breaks. A couple of times a chapter would end and the next chapter would pick up right where that one left off. It disrupted the flow towards the end of the book. It was just a strange choice. Like, it was written that way just to manufacture tension because the author couldn't think of a better way to do it. Though I suspect it was more to just keep the chapter shorter and the book moving at a faster pace. I actually struggled with what to rate the Atlantis Gene. I'm settling on three stars right now, but I'm really on that line for four stars. Aside from the big issues and some smaller ones that I mentioned previously, this was a very well done book. Given that these books were picked up by traditional publishers for six figures, I think a lot of people agree. It's a great mix between thriller and science fiction, it's smart but not so smart that it loses the reader, and it's just a pretty good story. At some point I may even read the rest of the series. From the summaries of the other two books, things get a little crazy. Also, they're shorter than the first one, so bonus points. The next in the series, though, is called The Atlantis Plague. It seems to focus mostly on the pandemic that was really just background noise in the first book. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not excited to read another pandemic novel until the one I'm living through calms the hell down. The last book I read in May has me cranky as all get out. I've mentioned before, but I have a bullet journal specifically record my thoughts on all the books that I read. Most books get between two and five pages of notes. Some have gone all the way up to eight, but those are usually outliers. Rarely a book gets more than that, but it usually only does that when it pisses me the hell off. Into the Last Great Kingdom, for example, got 26 pages of notes. Temptation by Ivy Smoke got 15 pages. As an asexual, I am uncomfortable. As a writer, I am irritated. And as a woman, I am furious. Temptation was another romance novel, and I feel unfortunate that I read On the Edge before this one, because On the Edge gave me some expectations of romance novels. I was expecting some kind of plot, perhaps a bit lazy, but still there, as a vessel to further the relationship between the main character and his or her love interest. Despite sex being part of the appeal of these books, my one previous example showed me that characters should still have some kind of development, and there should be other aspects of their relationship besides their complementary genitalia. This book meant none of those expectations. It was basically just porn, and the sex scenes were very graphic compared to On the Edge. Explicit descriptions of genitals and what they did with said genitals, I could handle the other book's sex scenes because they were tastefully done. Like, a little further than a sex scene in a Bioware game, you might get a little bit of boob and a little bit of somebody's butt, but nobody's grandmother's gonna pass out over this. No! Temptation sex scenes were basically HBO if you fall asleep during Harry Potter movie at 9pm and wake up at 3am to a porn parody of The Hills Have Eyes. I believe it was called The Hills Have Thighs, and the amount of volume I was on did not make that experience less scarring. This book has absolutely no plot. Our main character is college sophomore Penny. She starts the book waiting in a coffee shop for 
somebody. I think it's her ex-boyfriend. Anyway, she has to go to class so she can't wait any longer, but on the way out, she runs into someone and spills coffee all over her shirt. Well, handsome stranger gives her his sweater to cover it up, and Penny spends a good portion of the next couple pages smelling this sweater. It's just this side of creepy, stalker amount of thinking about this sweater. Imagine her surprise, then, when the owner of said sweater turns out to be the very handsome teacher of one of her classes. And then she spends the rest of the book pining after this guy. She's constantly fantasizing about him. They do actually get together at some point, but it's just sex. All they do is copulate and for some strange reason I cannot fathom, profess their love for one another. Maybe my less sexually averse humans out there can explain to me if it's possible for sex to be so good that you just fall in love with the other person? Please, someone break down this concept for me. I'll be waiting. You'd think if the author wasn't going to spend pages on a plot, we could make up for it in the character development area, right? Well, we don't. The characters in this book are one-dimensional as hell. Penny has, from what I can determine, no hobbies. All she does in this book is think about guys and sex. Her and Professor James Hunter don't even talk about shared hobbies. They don't talk about interests. They don't have normal conversations that don't end in sex. As if the fact that this book isn't terrible enough, the author also makes some strange style choices in the dialogue tag department. There will be these long conversations that span one or more pages, but there will be no dialogue tags. No he said, no she said, no action to break up the conversation a little, nothing to indicate where the characters are, what they're doing, how they're feeling. So not only is this book bad substance-wise, it's also written terribly. Not every single line in a block of dialogue needs to have tags, but give me something. It probably doesn't need to be said, but I gave this book one star. Like the previous romance novel I read, I finished Temptation in about a six hour period. I did take a break in the middle to shoot people in Battlefront 2. I also probably could have finished it faster if I hadn't stopped every 10 pages or so to furiously scribble more notes into my reading journal. This book had me so steamed and not in a fun way. I'm tempted to put out a full review or I guess rant like I did with the end of The Last Great Kingdom, so let me know in the comments if that's something you guys would like because I have so much anger in my heart for this book. I'd air all of my grievances here, but this video is going to be long enough already, so I'll spare you guys. And that's it. Those are all the books I read in May. I know I meant to read Aurora Burning, but I never got to it. Obviously, things are a little crazy right now. Finding the motivation and mental energy to film has been a little bit difficult. Uh, current events got me all distracted and ruffled. Again, I, I've said this before, but I don't know which is more weary, my body or my soul. I've got a handful of videos planned for the next little while, you know, once I get off my ass. My June TBR should be up soon, and it's, it's an ambitious one. I also promised a friend of mine I would read the sequel novella to On the Edge, and of course I'm going to make a video out of that because your girl needs content. May need to also add angry review of Temptation to my to-do list if you guys express some interest in that. As usual, please hit the like button. It helps me, I think. Mostly it makes me feel better about all of this. Subscribe if you like what you see and you want some more. You can also follow me on Twitter at MaxPilot. I check it often, even if I don't post often. Finally, thanks for watching. Just because it's not as prevalent in the news anymore, COVID-19 is still out there. So wash your hands, wear your masks, and stay away from each other. I'll see you in the next video.